Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, go ahead and leave a five-star review on iTunes. For example, here's a really great review from, <laughs> this is his real name, Mayor McDickcheese. <laughs> Mayor McDickcheese says, "I usually I try and write a funny comment just to hear Chrissy say it, but dang, this is legit becoming my favorite podcast, and I listen to it a lot. After listening to more serious conspiracy pods, it's nice to come to Chrissy and get some legit laughs while also getting a nice dose of red pilling. Well, thank you very much, Mayor McDickcheese. Wow. And I've said it three times now. Uh, shout out to some of my stand-up dates. I'm going to be doing stand-up, uh, hopefully, in a city near you. Thursday, August 12th, I'll be headlining Bird and Betty's on the Jersey Shore in Beach Haven, New Jersey. And then I'm heading to New Orleans, August 13th and 14th, to perform at the Comedy House in New Orleans. And then September 10th and 11th, I'll be with Comedians at the Compound going to Vegas. Uh, we're going to be doing the Comedy Works Theater over there at the Plaza Hotel. And then I'll be back in Texas September 17th. 18th and 18th to headline hyenas in dallas and then comedians of the compound will be doing a stadium show out in lakewood new jersey october 16th and then i will be in santa monica october 22nd and 23rd at the broadway comedy club west doing four shows out there in santa monica california so excited to see what's left of california <laughs> it's gonna be great Quick shout out uh, to our sponsor, Cushy Dreams. Go to CushyDreams.com for all things high quality CBD. Enjoy all the health benefits of CBD without getting high. Um, Cushy Dreams offers a premium lineup of high quality CBD in either tins or pre-rolls. You can enjoy all the health benefits without getting high. Uh, there's multiple, there's different strands here like dream, peace, energy, relax, create, hustle, awake, uh, so whatever you want to do with your day, Cushy Dreams has you covered. Um, so go to their website, cushydreams.com. That's K-U-S-H-Y dreams.com. And at checkout, use promo code CMP. You're going to get 20% off every order. Join the men and women who are sick of vapes and gummies and want to smoke their CBD. All right, enough with that. I'm so excited to have this guy on the podcast today. He is a constitutional lawyer. In fact, he has been called one of the central figures in the free speech battle by the one and only Dave Rubin. Uh, so high praise from Dave Rubin there. So excited to have him on the podcast today. Uh, welcome to the show, Robert Barnes. How are you? Good, good. So excited to have you here. Apparently you're coming to us fresh off an Alex Jones appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Both today and on uh, Thursday. So uh, was discussing all the, uh, in, you know, I mean, it's a uh, unique time to be alive from a, a legal and political perspective. Now, what got you, like, if we could dial it way, way back, like, what made you first want to start working with and representing Alex? Because I think he is someone that a lot of people would want to avoid and would be scared of and would be worried that, you know, being near him would be, uh, I guess, bad for their reputation. I don't feel that way, personally. I think he's he's pretty ballsy and he's uh, almost an oracle of sorts, especially in this day and age. He's predicted a lot of things that have come true. Um, but if you want to go into a little bit of depth, you know, background on how you started working with him. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I've known him for uh, many years. Uh, he ran into a rain. I mean, basically he's someone who had experienced very little litigation outside of, you know, the divorce context, uh, his entire career until 2017. So he went from being basically never sued for a quarter century to facing 20 or more lawsuits all across the nation within 12 months. And to me, that was political targeting and the sign of political targeting. They didn't he didn't suddenly, you know, stop complying with different laws. It, they decided that uh, <clears throat> that they were going to launch a lawfare against him, which was becoming increasingly common in the modern age, politicized uh, legal weaponry against uh, people usually that are underdogs, at least in the court of law. And so that was the context in which uh, I, the he talked to me about coming in and giving him some uh, strategic advice. And that was the original goal. And then he needed me to step in occasionally to formally uh, represent him in court. Uh, it is the case. Now, I've represented clients all across the political and ideological spectrum. So to me, it was a no brainer. Uh, no, I mean, I found the First Amendment issues greatly implicated by what they were trying to do. They were basically trying to make it a quasi crime to have a conspiracy theory. 
hmm. um, at a key time in which a lot of conspiracy theories seem to be more like predictions than theories, uh, as we've seen just this past week. And so in that, uh, I thought it very important to defend him precisely because a lot of key people would not defend him. Now, I'm personal friends with him, so that added to the equation. But the uh, but no doubt, I knew that as soon as I represented him, there'd be a group of clients. Uh, there was a lawyer who worked for me who quit immediately. No. Uh, there were you know other people who were like, no way. Now, what's fascinating is all the people who hate Alex Jones, almost all of them have actually never really listened to Alex Jones. They have no idea who he is. They don't know him as a human being. They, they've, they, they've seen little snippets out of context. Like the uh, uh, and I mean, they brought a smart case from a political perspective. You couldn't find more sympathetic people than the parents and people connected to the tragedy and trauma of Sandy Hook. Um, but what a lot of people did not know is that uh, Alex Jones had never talked about any of those individuals by name for the most part ever. Uh, m almost everyone suing him had never complained a single time to him before filing suit. So these suits weren't quite what was the press was making them out to be. And uh, so I knew that the factual reality was different than what the press and the public thought. I knew that the person was different than the stereotype and character caricatures that had been attached to him. And the constitutional issues were significant and meaningful. And I've never allowed the political controversy, uh, uh, co politically controversial character of my client to deter my representation. So I've represented, I mean, literally Green Party, Peace and Freedom Party, Libertarian Party, Tea Party, Constitution Party, Taxpayers Party. Ralph Nader, Wesley Snipes, Joe Francis, all those people on the left, and not only Alex Jones, but the Covington kids and uh, Donald Trump uh, during the elections, uh, the and, you know, the, uh, and all those parties that you can name on the right. So uh, it's never been a deterrent for me. But yeah, as a lawyer, you face negative consequences. I mean, Alex couldn't get tons of people who'd known him forever to represent him, even people who knew he was innocent, uh, knew he was not, but knew the accusations against him were not true. They were scared of what their other law legal people in the legal community would think of them. And and that that says something very frightening about the nature of our legal profession today. Yeah, you would think that they would be above sort of like social pressure, peer pressure, sort of like bullying. Like it's like you said, most people, they just don't like the idea of Alex Jones. They don't like his uh, reputation. They haven't actually listened to him or met him in person. Uh, and I admire you for that. You know, I that's one of the biggest reasons why I started this podcast. I was like, I really feel like I need to talk to and uh, shine a light on folks who have been censored, who have been deplatformed, who have been, you know, kicked off of social media because I'm like, well, <laughs> they don't tend to kick people off social media who are, are just like wild. Like if, if that were the case, all flat earthers would be, would, would not have a platform, but it's uh I, I realized early on, I was like, okay, these people probably have a, at least a couple of nuggets of truth and it makes them a little bit dangerous. Um, was, was Wesley Snipes your first kind of like high profile, um, person that you represented? Was he, it depends on which world someone inhabited. Mm -hmm. So probably, I mean, uh, I worked for a public interest law firm soon after law school and we sued every major bank and we're, we're talking about subprime lending problems in 2002. Uh, you know, six years before it became famous and well known when it crashed the market. The uh, so in certain circles, people knew us because we were trying to brainstorm unique ways to hold big banks accountable and trying to highlight the problems that were coming. And then the other half of the time was representing victims of domestic violence. And some of those cases had local notoriety, uh, but not national notoriety. Uh, and the first nationally uh, national no notorious case. I mean, I worked for a personal injury firm that had some prominent cases, but again, they're not necessarily a national level notoriety, though the lawyer I worked for was like something right out of John Grisham's King of Torts, um, had a lion's head ring for his wedding ring, <laughs> the, whole, the whole nine yards, um, had an Irish castle, you, you, you name it. But the uh, but brilliant lawyer bro, taught me a lot in short order, but probably the first famous client I represented was likely Ralph Nader in 2004. Because uh, it represented him in a range of election access cases across the country. That case went on for five years, uh, ultimately went up and down to the U.S. Supreme Court several times, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals several times, just to guarantee the right of people to circulate petitions for the causes that they chose or the candidate of their choice and for access to the ballot for independent candidates for the presidency. So that was and then I actually originally represented Snipes in New York. Uh, the city of New York brought an insane paternity allegation against him on behalf of uh, the state of Indiana, 
who knew they were bringing a fraudulent case. I mean, the uh, wow. uh, they knew, but they was like Wesley Snipes. He's famous. It's going to make us famous. All that jazz. And we brought a big sort of precedent setting civil rights case, got the city of New York ultimately to fold on appeal. And he won that case. And then later was the criminal tax case. But uh, uh, Nader was probably the first nationally notorious case I was attached to. And then the second, the second one would have been Wesley Snipes. Have you always had uh, like, I guess a soft spot or a passion for wanting to represent like the underdog or did that come with experience? Oh, no, no, that, that was a choice. I mean, in my view, it was the only reason to be a lawyer. Um, you, you can make money doing lots of things. Uh, so the, if the goal was money, there's other ways to do it, easier ways to do it. Um, and the, and so I, I like the idea of, you know, the Perry Masons, the Matlocks, the, the Jerry Spences, uh, of the world, you know, people who had been independent, uh, and for the most part through their careers had represented outsiders and underdogs. That's who needed representation. That's who needed, uh, people fighting for them, not only in the court of law, but sometimes in the court of public opinion, when their case was often being tried there too. And so it was a, a natural goal for me. And it was something that I sought out, not always fun and enjoyable to be the underdog or representing the underdog. Cause you're stacked, you know, the odds are stacked against you, but the, uh, but it, it's enjoyable from a professional a professional standpoint. I mean, who cares if you win when you're a 90% favorite hmm. and the, uh, and then uh, personal uh, political uh, principles uh, just made it a natural alignment for me. It was the reason why I became a lawyer. Wow. That's really commendable. I, I remember like my first job right out of college, I worked at Radio City Music Hall and they kept like, I was a tour guide. I had no freaking clue like what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Like I didn't have great guidance, but I remember I was like working there, giving tours. I had to like memorize this huge stack of facts and they kept telling us, you know, like a lot of famous people have had their start working here. Like Wesley Snipes was an usher. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> I was was like, that in New York? Yeah, because you know he yeah. tells lots of stories in New York. Yeah, he remembers falling down in New York on the ice and everybody laughing and just it's fascinating the different stories. I mean, people forget he was a professionally trained dancer. He was in the video back. Right. Uh, uh, our first conversation was about Michael Jackson's case that Tom Mesereau was defending him in, and why I thought Jackson would be acquitted and why I actually thought he was innocent. Uh, the uh, and so from there on we got along great. But uh, yeah, people forget. I mean, he is and Andy. He loves to be a DJ in his own time. Very kind of an introvert, actually, definitely an introvert uh, with certain extroverted sides of him. But, uh, you know, very nice person uh, behind the scenes. Very loyal guy. Uh, talked to him recently at a boxing match right right before COVID went nuts up in New York. Uh, when Comic Con was up there, actually, I was there with my brother and my son. So the uh, uh, you know cool guy, very laid back guy, very namast kind of guy. Uh, very Sela, you know, Hunter Thompson kind of thing. The mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that kind of demeanor disposition. Uh, but uh, yeah, but it had it has a more interesting history than most people know about, mostly because he's very private. He doesn't like to be in the public limelight. Yeah, you'd be amazed how many sort of like celebrities are actually like low key introverts. It's like we just see so much of them. We think you know we know everything about their lives, but then you meet them and they're like, oh god. <laughs> well, there's a I, classic I, one of uh, uh, TMZ tracked him down once, and the uh, when he was in LA, and he hates that, and so he went. He, they, he's he, they're following him all along, and he pretends to go up to a house, and he pretends that he's staying at this house, and he's like trying to open the door, and he's looking back, and he's hoping that they take the buy, they take take a buy into it, uh, and of course they don't. So then he has to turn around, and you know, it was that's the lengths he will go to to avoid uh, invasive public uh, interaction. I just find it, I'm so impressed with you. Like you, you represent Alex Jones, you represent the Covington kids. Um, you're for free speech, you're for the underdog. And I find the more people I talk to, whether it's like even in like the comic book world or the stand up comedy world or entertainment, like there's always kind of like a woke versus non woke side. It seems now to every industry and how, how do I just I wonder how that and you've already spoken a little bit like, yeah, you lost a couple friends when you started associating with Alex. Um, but what has has there been much of a backlash now? It seems like if you're going to represent the Covington kids, Alex, um, you know, you were a, tr a fan of Trump, but like not like an apologist. You're not trying to make it seem like he's this perfect guy. Um, how do you deal with, I guess, the backlash or I'm sure you get a ton of shit for for working with the people that you do. Yeah, it just depends on the circle. So the first time people really got upset at me, it was, interestingly enough, a lot of Democrats were mad at me representing Ralph Nader. Uh, 
because they were convinced that Nader was the reason why Gore lost in 2000. And Gore was from Tennessee and I'm from Tennessee. So I knew a lot of people in the same circles. I used to be a Democratic political campaign consultant back in the early 90s, uh, had become politically independent and kind of agnostic until Trump had been betting on elections, but hadn't been voting in elections from 1996 until 2016. The, uh, and so it, it, different reactions, but there were people, I, uh, the first time people really went ballistic was Ralph Nader, oddly enough. Then, the, and then everybody was chill about all the other controversial cases I took. And I used to say that I guarantee you there's somebody I've represented that somebody in the audience hates because they hate my clients hate each other. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, because they're that far apart politically on the spectrum. The only thing they have in common is that in my cases, they're underdogs, even if they're millionaires or billionaires, in my cases, they're not, uh, the favorite. Because when you're up against the U.S. government, you're always the underdog. The uh, and did a lot of criminal tax cases in that context. Uh, but you know, represented people, you know, accused tax protesters, and you know, everybody across the political spectrum. Uh, but it was uh, it was only the 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 next two that caused trouble was being associated with Trump. There were lawyer friends of mine that just went ballistic, you know, blocked me on Facebook randomly, you know, things like that, just because I said something favorable about Trump. And I've been a populist my whole life, so that shouldn't have been a shock to anybody. But the uh, and then the next thing was Alex Jones. Uh, people just go absolutely nuts uh, about him. I had you know, you know a lot of clients that uh, that would turn down representation as soon as they're like, oh, you know, you know, you know, I like your Barnes, but. You represented Alex Jones, and I can't be associated with Alex Jones. I mean, the Daily Beast, I know what who's writing the article, whether it's left or right, depending on who they associate with me. So when the right would write a hit piece on me, it would be Robert Barnes, lawyer for Wesley Snipes, or Ralph Nader, or Joe Francis, or whomever. The you know, Mr. Girls Gone Wild, different. That's a that's a different kind of client. But the uh I didn't represent him in that area. I represented him in tax area. Um, but the, uh, but man, wow. But yeah, another story, the, uh, <laughs> so the whole dynamic, of, but it was interesting. I mean, there were some people that got really mad at the Joe Francis representation. Um, why? But, uh, be, uh, I mean, uh, some of them probably rightly, um, the it's public that I didn't like them and didn't get along with them and finally got out of the case, uh, tried to withdraw multiple times. Now he was being framed by a lot of corrupt actors and ultimately they dismissed or well, they did a plea deal where he did no time and paid like a $2,000 fine and got to keep a lot of the money. So, and that was based on the fact that I was able to document entrapment was going on. The the whistleblower was actually really working for the government and getting a percentage of the cash. And, and he was yeah. actually the CFO and the CTO of the company and all of that. But Joe had a deserved reputation for maybe some other things that were more problematic and only some of which is public knowledge. But I was not a fan. I wanted out, didn't want to represent him. Uh, for the most part, I only represent clients that I like, at least. Uh, I mean, I'm in the privileged position of being there. Now, I agree with uh, Dershowitz that, that, that there need to be lawyers who represent, who look like, uh, represent the, uh, their clients like a taxi cab driver. You take whomever walks in the back of the cab because otherwise the legal system will break down. But Dershowitz always also says that you should only take cases that you are conscientious and can do a good job in. And for me personally, I can't take a case I don't believe in and I can't represent a client I don't like um, at some level. You know, it don't have to be best buddies, but I need to like them at some level because otherwise it will interfere with my ability to be effective on their behalf. And if I don't think they're innocent at some fundamental level, and that can be different than what the law defines as innocence, uh, I can't be an effective advocate for them. And so, and jurors sniff that out, judges sniff that out, opposing parties sniff that out. So for me to be effective, I have to believe in them. And that's why I limit myself to those clients, not because I think that's a good moral position, because actually I agree with Dershowitz. Lawyers need to be more broad in who they represent. But for me, that's all I can do. But yeah, there, there's plenty of people that get mad and agitated at me. But the worst were a combination of Nader, Trump, and Jones. Those are the three people that cost me the most friendships. <laughs> Well, you know, it's less people to invite to your birthday party. So ultimately, you know, you don't have to buy as big of a cake. <laughs> if you boil yeah. down what Alex Jones does, it's like, I think why it's so important to hear him out is like he ultimately just questions authority. And when we can't question our authorities and our and our government, it that's sad. That's like it gets very scary very quick. And it's like if people listen to him and you think, all right, this guy's full of shit. OK, then like go about your day. Um it's just when we try to like, I mean, and he was one of the earliest people to be totally canceled. And 
uh, oh. censored by social media. Like back before it was cool. Probably when when would he when did he start to get really censored? What like 2017 or so? Yeah, and and you could argue the campaign against him started in the summer of 2016 when Hillary Clinton targeted him in a speech in I think Las Vegas. And that was the beginning of it. Uh, and from that point forward, all of a sudden, everybody's got a copyright claim against them. Everybody's got, you know, there's all the Sandy Hook uh, plaintiffs, again, 90% of whom had never complained or said a word to Alex Jones in seven years. Suddenly now they're deeply bothered and have, and have had their lives destroyed because of this. Um, a lot of political lawyers all involved in a lot of those cases. Wow. And they used the lawsuits to then coordinate the mass canceling on big tech. Cause I mean, he was one of the most popular people on YouTube, you know, YouTube had given him an early award and, and ba on the same day, I believe you, and they used a law, a judgment in a lawsuit. There wasn't a final judgment. It was just a preliminary ruling uh, that allowed the case to go forward that uh, to have Facebook uh, and YouTube uh, through, which is basically Google uh, and, and Twitter to get rid of them. I think all of them did it within a day or two. And not long thereafter, he was the first guy to out and say, you know, I think Joe Biden might have some health issues, some mm. mental cogn uh, cognitive issues. Instagram went nuts. And this is at that point was owned by Facebook. So Facebook not only removed his Instagram account for pointing out in advance what all of us now know is obvious uh, and the and not not for misinformation. And then actually banned the use of his name, said you could be banned if you and it's not like Alex Jones is the most you know, a totally uncommon name. So for all the other Alex Joneses out there, they were That's potentially tough screwed. for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, it, it, he was the template and they knew that the conservative establishment, like the liberal, the liberal establishment hated him. The, a lot of your anti-establishment people on the left had lost touch with him because they were so mad about him endorsing Trump. And they forgot that the number one advocate on the right for against war is Alex Jones. The number one advocate on the right against the surveillance state is Alex Jones. The number one person on the right against big pharma is Alex Jones. The number one person on the right uh, backing whistleblowers like Snowden and Assange and putting people like William Binney on for the last 10 plus years is Alex Jones. And yet they got suckered and snookered by the Sandy Hook plaintiffs cases to demonize Alex Jones. People like Jimmy Dore, people like uh, Max Blumenthal, people uh, to some degree like Aaron Maté, uh, people like Glenn Greenwald, who's scared to go on Alex Jones. And why? I mean, Alexander Cockburn was one of the most independent left. He was Glenn Greenwald before Glenn Greenwald. And who was the person who platformed him more than anybody? Alex Jones. Uh, but they forgot this. I mean, this was the most important populist anti-establishment vote on uh, voice on the right by far. I mean, it does. It's not even close. There's nobody that compares to him. It's not. A, he was the leader of the lockdown protest. The first guy to point out the risks both of the virus and of the lockdown response to the virus. Uh, took noble first guy to out Bill Gates and, and Bill Gates' role in all of this. And so the uh, he's a critical, essential voice. And they, they're not scared of him because they think he's wrong so often. They're scared of him because they know he's right so often. And for people watching who don't know, where would you say, like, when did Alex's, I guess, other than being a target for being kind of over the target and right about many things, when did his sort of like personal profile begin to be tarnished was it ultimately i mean what was it that he said about sandy hook did he say it was like it could have been a false flag like what was it about that that most of the story him about him fire? and sandy hook is is made up so the i mean so jones starts out on public access tv in the early 90s uh you know became really popular ended up with his own talk radio station there in in austin uh or talk radio uh, program became intensely popular and he was probably the next rush limbaugh in 2001 uh, he, a lot of leftists loved him. You know, he went up and bu busted into Bohemian Grove and filmed a bunch of stuff. He right. was in, scan yeah, I think, a Scanner Darkly in another film. You know, he's hanging out with Willie Nelson. He's anti the Bush family. So all the Austin lefties love him. He's anti Big Pharma, anti war, anti the surveillance state. And early on, a bunch of his predictions come true. I mean, the, the, he's 17 years old and he's out there saying on, you know, on uh, on his the public access show that he would have the, around that time. But early on, he's out there telling people that the, the incubator baby story that led us into the Iraqi war is false. And it's because of who he grew up with and other people he knew. He has an inherent skepticism of power and the people who wield it and the people who get it and why they're doing it. And he knew the long history of them lying for all kinds of reasons to grab power. And he ends up right within a couple of years. 
And then, you know, you have Waco and Ruby Ridge and Waco's not far from where he is in Texas. And so he, he unravels a lot of those stories. Oklahoma City takes place. A lot of things are covered up related to that, including PatCon and other factors that now have sort of echoes in January 6th. And so the and so he sees and then he's been telling people that there's something like Operation Northwoods and the, actually the government back in the 60s approved doing fa false flag and staged events. Everybody says you're nuts, Alex. And then in 1998, they declassify it. And yes, indeed, the Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on staged false flag events in order to go to war with Cuba. And the only thing that stopped him was President Kennedy. The uh, And so he sees all these things confirmed and affirmed. And then he predicts you know, several months in advance what's going to happen on 9-11 to a large degree. Uh, he's friends with the X-Files folks who do the Lone Gunman show, who do a show that almost is exactly the 9-11 script about six months before 9-11 happens. Wow. So he has a big choice to make. He He's told if he goes and questions the institutional narrative on 9-11 that they will cancel him. All of his talk radio stations will cancel him. Institutional conservatives with, with Fox were all in the foxhole of 9-11 Bush talk during Bush's regime. Jones was a longtime critic of the Bush regime. He becomes a leader, 9-11 skeptic. And that's the first time the institutional media puts him from, oh, he's just sort of this little talk radio guy and he's eclectic and the left hangs out with him, to now he's a dangerous guy, dangerous misinformation. That's when that label first attaches to him is his willingness to question the 9-11 narrative. And you flash forward, he's mostly politically agnostic, deep Bush family political critic. Uh, until Obama, 2010, 2011, he becomes very skeptical of sort of the new liberal democratic professional class, the beginning of the wokesters, and starts to become very critical of them. And he's then start be he's perceived as being on the right. And that's when people on the left abandon him and start to become harshly critical. When Sandy Hook occurs, there's not much criticism because he says he says Sandy Hook happens and he says the culprits are you know, big pharma, uh, the violence, the glorification of violence in gaming and Hollywood culture, the failure to have meaningful mental health treatment for so many uh, mentally uh, 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 sort of limited individuals, the failures of the public educational system. That's what he highlights. And he says they're going to politicize it and blame the gun instead. Hmm. And, and for two years, that's basically all that's said. And throughout the whole time period, 99% of what InfoWars ever publishes or says, says Sandy Hook happened. He occasionally in the next couple of years will have a caller come in who he responds and a lot. And there was a portion of people who didn't believe Sandy Hook happened at all. And I have reasons why I think that psychologically they, they went that route. Denial is a very powerful tool. If you have kids of your own around the same age of those kids who tragically and traumatically died there. But what caused most of the skepticism and blowback to Sandy Hook was how quickly the Obama administration politicized it. You know, if they hadn't have politicized it so fast, it wouldn't have got the blowback that it got politically. The second problem that increased suspicion of, of a lot of people in the in the that community was the government was weird about hiding information from the FOIA, Cal Connecticut's version of FOIA. They wouldn't disclose basic records, basic information. You dig in, you find out why. After Columbine, there were basic safety mechanisms put in at schools across the country to avoid the, what happened at Columbine, at least the severity of it. And one of those was to make sure parents, I'm um, sorry, teachers could uh, lock the doors of their classrooms and have other safe spaces within a classroom specifically for school safety, school shooter risks. Well, the, the school in Sandy Hook, the politicians pocketed the cash instead. They didn't have basic uh -huh. means to lock, the teachers couldn't even lock their own doors. They couldn't even lock the bathroom doors inside their classrooms. That's why the number of people that died that day likely died that day. And the politicians needed to hide that. And so they played games, blame the gun, blame the gun, blame the gun. That's part one of their defense. And part two is hide everything, hide everything, hide everything. But to people watching it, they think maybe there is something deeper going on here. Why are they hiding basic information like the police reports that they hid, I think, for almost five years? Wow. Um, it turned out that was why people went fishing in the wrong place. But basically, they're suing him over a few statements over a few years in response to a few questions. I think it's a total of 30 words, something like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, that gave it people who never complained at the time to the statements he made. They just sued him right out of the blue. I mean, there's a few people who you know, told him about a week or two weeks before they were going to sue him. Um, but that's it. And so 
Sandy Hook, in my view, is the pretext, a politically effective pretext, but it's not the reason he's under attack. The real reason was I have partially his supporting of Trump in 2016. And the other, if people had the agenda, what we're seeing right now in terms of how the pandemic politically is playing out, the, the number one person warning of the risk related to this over the last 20 years has been Alex Jones. And the number one person you would want to deplatform uh, would be Alex Jones. The number one person you would want to defame is Alex Jones. The number one person you don't want people to listen to is the one guy saying, by the way, I think China may be trying to do a bioweapon or there's risk of a bioweapon leaking out. By the way, I think the government wants to use it as a pretext to con legally control your body by forcing a vaccine into your system. I think the government wants to use this to have mass house arrest, things he's been talking about for 20 years. Uh, if you didn't want that voice being heard very much, you'd probably target him for lawfare and deplatforming. It makes sense. And if you're looking to to turn your population into just good little people who obey and never question, like I can understand how he'd be among the first to take out. Um, what, what, what was the moment for you that kind of, cause you, you say you used to be sort of more like Democrat and then you turned more like agnostic and turned more populist was, what was the particular moment that, or, or was it a series of moments that helped you, you know, go that way? And also like, what do you think the, the word populist means to you? Oh, sure. So I've been a populist since I was a kid. I mean, since I knew of its idea and its history. Uh, and what it was is which party would most effectively advocate for populism has varied in, in my uh, experience. So when I was young, the Republican Party was the country club party. Uh, and the yeah. Democratic Party had a lot of union roots, it, it, you know, private sector union roots, not governmental union roots. In the South in particular, there were a lot of populist Democrats going back to Huey Long, Earl Long in Louisiana, Big Jim Folsom in Alabama. When I was growing up, Ned Ray McWhorter, the governor of Tennessee, the former fire and police commissioner of Chattanooga, Bookie Turner, who I did my senior history paper on. Hmm. So that was my sort of experience. And if, uh, you know, the there was no way you'd be on the Repu – I was briefly as a younger kid on the Republican side because of my evangelical uh, Baptist upbringing. And so that side of cultural populism was on the right, but Poppy Bush was one step too far for me. And so that led me more back to the Democratic side of the equation as being the, the manageable, particularly in the small town South. You had a lot of old school Democrats back then. Um, who, you know, were, were Democrats because the Democratic Party was the party of Social Security, the party of Medicare for the elderly, uh, the party of college access for blue collar kids, the party of roads and bridges and, and things like that. And in particularly East Tennessee, electrification and, and the rest. Um, it was uh, in the Republican Party had some new religious folks in it that I was culturally kindred with. But otherwise, it was still the country club party, the corporate party. My hometown, it was the party of Lookout Mountain and Signal Mountain that looked down on the rest of us that lived in the city itself. That uh, I was a, I went up to I was at Yale at the time as scholarship. And that first summer I worked in D.C. I ran the Yale Political Union. So we did speaking events with James Woolsey at the CIA, with George Stephanopoulos inside the White House, which was actually part of a whole budget plan is why we were invited. I didn't even know about it. I uh, didn't find out until Bob Woodward's book later. You know, Senator, you know, uh, Senator Kerry in his own private chambers about Iran Contra, uh, the you know Larry King, who kept asking me for the, the phone number of one of the uh, girls that went with us to the thing. I was like, I think you're married still, Larry. That's really not my job. <laughs> so the uh, those kind of things. So it was crazy fun. Mm -hmm. But while I was there, I did Sunday internship work at the White House. I got to see how power worked. It was the beginning of the West Wing era. The West Wing TV show is what I mean by that where you had this young professional class that was going to dominate the political class. It wasn't going to be your old school people who worked their way up in the old political machines, which had their disadvantages, but often had certain advantages in being connected to the working class. The new class were all, you know, Yaleys and Harvard and Cornell and those kind of elite schools, uh, usually from the East Coast and West Coast and saw the rest of the world as flyover country unless they lived in the lakeshore of North Chicago. Um, and they were the ones taking over D.C. They were the ones who saw themselves as West Wing real life heroes. Uh, you know, I think Jack Posobiec calls it, you know, LARPing West Wing <laughs> styles, the current Biden administration, which is true of their staffing. And and everything else I witnessed, um, you know, the the reason why Ralph Nader left was the same reason I left. I just left earlier. I realized by 1994 that this was all a sham. Democratic Party wasn't going to do anything. Republican Party wasn't going to do anything. Populists were just screwed. Blue collar people were screwed. 
And, and that's where I got politically agnostic. And, you know, I talked to people like Pat Buchanan and Warren Beatty, who thought about running his independence, talked to people connected to Ross Perot, but ultimately decided, okay, this is just going to be a waste of time, not going to be able to make any difference, step back from it, and only bet on it uh, from that time forward, all the way up until Trump. And when I, and I started looking at Trump solely for the purposes of betting on him. And then listening to him speak, I was like, wow, there's a lot of real honest populism here that I've never heard from an American presidential candidate willing to question narratives that nobody was willing to question. Like, hey, why don't we just get along with Putin? Hey, why don't we just get out of the Mideast? Hey, why do we even have NATO? Maybe we should just redo our trade deals with China. Uh, you know, And stuff that nobody else was willing to talk about or broach in a meaningful manner. Uh, and totally fearless involved with the media and his response, his you know, persuasive his persuasion skill set was always off the charts. But I was shocked by this. I was like, wow, I really like the guy. And when he won, it was a reminder that the system was not as completely impossible to overcome Broken. as I yeah. once thought. Uh, and so I thought, you know, people like me really should engage uh, politically. Uh, because Trump is proof that you can, in fact, be very independent and outside the system and prevail. And if, you know, Bernie Sanders had any cojones, uh, Bernie may have been able to achieve the same thing. I'd known Bernie since Yale days. Uh, and there were parts of what Bernie believed. I mean, particularly 2015 Bernie. It was a lot more honest Bernie than 2021 Bernie. But, you know, once Bernie could could smell the uh, drapes in the White House, a different <laughs> attitude came, took over him. But, you know, back in the day, you know, he, he was a real independent voice. Even if I disagreed with him on some, on some stuff, he was willing to take on some powerful people and, and have dissident opinions. Uh, but the fact that it was like, wow, if he had any real old school populist skill and full and more full scale populist beliefs, he would have won the Democratic nomination. Um, if he was just as ruthless as Trump, he would have won the Democratic nomination. And I was like, OK, so both of these things happening are proof to me that you can actually change the world if you believe in it which is something I'd always believed from a philosophical perspective, but had just forfeited politically. So that's why I re-engaged on populist politics. It was uh, the success of Trump. Yeah, I think he inspired and engaged so many people that were just like, what's the point? The two, you know, it's all bullshit. Like I grew up listening to my dad talk about like Ross Perot and it's all bullshit and you can't trust anybody. And I was just like, yeah, I guess I see his point. And then Trump came around and I didn't vote for him in 2016. It took me a while to like get on board. But when I did, I was like, oh, like I of course see his, he, he was such a breath of fresh air. Like, of course, not a perfect person, but no. saying a lot of the things that hadn't been said that needed to be said. And Absolutely. I think his greatest contribution is like, and I'm not even like a, a I'm not like an expert political science person at all, but like poked such a hole in the media. Like, you know, you'd hear him say fake news, fake news. And then one day I just was like, oh, my God, he's right. Like, it is fake news. Like, and and I never, ever and then never went back. And then I never saw it the same way again. And like, for me, that was his biggest contribution. He exposed the people that needed exposing. It's what Bob Jones Jr. did when he was defending why he supported Harry Truman in 1948 and Harry Truman's tendency to cuss and Bob Jones being the founder of a very conservative evangelical school later on. And he said, Harry Truman cusses the folks who need cussing. And uh, I said, you know, they, you could say that about Donald Trump. Uh, he exposed the people that really needed exposing. All the roaches got uh, fully exposed. Well, just, just by Trump being Trump. I mean, like half the time he didn't even set out to do it. He just has a, has a strong spine, great sense of instincts, and a lot of his limitations were whenever he trusted the system to be fair or just he, by whom he appointed to key positions of power, certain policy de uh, deferences that he made. That's when he got burnt more often than not. You know, the uh, when he would listen to his instincts, he would succeed at a, at a very high rate. And definitely the most, in my view, the most like despite his criticism of, oh, he lies so much. In my view, he's the most honest president we've had in forever. You know, like, I mean, I give people give Jimmy Carter credit. Jimmy was honest to a degree. Uh, you know, the, the there are a lot of things you could look at with Jimmy that were sort of limited. Um, you know, I think Jimmy prided himself on his reputation of honesty in a certain respect. But Trump had a sort of a deeper, truer sense of honesty that was beyond just the surface uh, that uh, was really refreshing and, and brilliant to witness. And that's why they targeted him so much. And then they... They don't understand they're never going to be able to take him out the way they think they are, that, that he's built differently. And it's part of the system's unwillingness and incapacity to recognize its adversary. 
Uh, and you see this across the board. I mean, just like Alex Jones, where they're being they, they really imagine that Alex Jones is that caricature from the Homeland series that they created. It's like, no, that's not who the guy is. He's a good old boy. He likes to go out in the lake, shoot some fireworks, drink beer, eat steak, uh, and just be a regular or ordinary everyday American who likes women and says it often. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, he, he, he is who he is. Uh, I mean, his, his little baby girl is a lot like him, which is, you know, the uh, curious, great conversationalist, very smart. You know, she's real little. And a little bit of a temper, which uh, which, uh, which, uh, which Alex has. <laughs> how old is she? How the, the his uh how oh he's same age as me. Uh, no, so the, the his uh, daughter. Oh, his daughter. Uh, his daughter is uh how old now? I think I want to say five. Oh four, five. my god! I'm just imagining. Oh, yeah, she's, like she's, a, she's adorable. She's, she's adorable. <laughs> I'm just imagining so a little girl, a little girl with like two braids, being like the globalists. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, and, and you know the and and, and he uh, adores her, of course. He's got older oh. daughters and an older son too from his first wife. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the, the, the little ones are, are, is great. She once stumbled across our. Uh, we we're out at his lake house, and uh, there are a bunch of cigars around and everything else. And she just sort of stumbled out there and started picking up on lighters and whatnot. So we weren't always great at uh, making sure everything was safe. But he was. Uh, but he's great. Yeah. The and but it's uh, you know deeply misunderstood. But we and Trump yeah. share in common. Deep, too deeply misunderstood human beings. I, I I feel for that. Yeah, I, I think it's important to elevate the voices of people who are deeply misunderstood and also censored and also deplatformed. It's like, it just, I don't know. I feel like it's the right thing to do. And so now we have with New York City, I live, you know, outside of New York City, we have the, these looming mandates. Uh, it's very scary for a lot of people. You know, I like came out recently said I wasn't going to perform at any New York City comedy clubs that were going to mandate vaccines. And then when I mentioned like, well, this is segregation by vaccination status, you know, the left likes to say, oh, how dare you compare this to segregation? But that's precisely what it is. And I and now, you know, Biden is it looks like he's going to also mandate the vaccine for the military as well. And I know a lot of my friends in the military are asking, like, what can First of all, what can they do? What, you know, what are their sort of like legal next steps? Uh, and also just the, the New Yorkers, like what can we do? Can they really, you know, I know they were trying to with the Excelsior Pass mandate the vaccines. I think maybe Madison Square Garden and Yankee Stadium might have might have been the only ones that were doing the Excelsior Pass. Clearly it didn't take on. Clearly most businesses were not <laughs> wanting to just, you know, exclude a, a large percentage of their potential customers but you know what yeah what are the sort of legal next steps here other than protesting and just being really pissed off about this well really what we're witnessing is what alex jones has been warning about for several decades which is the attempt for the state to assert legal authority to govern what goes in your own body and condition your ability to access basic human services leaving your own home traveling, being at a funeral with family members, being at a, a wedding with family members, uh, going to, you know, just having Thanksgiving with family members, being able to go to church, being able to go to school, send your kids to school, being able to get in the subway, use public transport, hop in a car, walk down the street, uh, travel anywhere else around the country or the world, uh, or simply to have a job, or as they've suggested, even go into a grocery store that that will be conditioned on you agreeing to the government getting to inject whatever the government says it wants to into your body. Even if it's an experimental drug using an experimental technology that has not been fully approved by the FDA as safe and effective, uh, and that is for a virus that for most people poses very little risk of severe harm. So in my view, there are constitutional restrictions on what government state actors can do, um, the some of that will contest old case law from the eugenics era of the United States Supreme Court, which I, I view what they're doing is they're trying to reinstate the legal principles that they first established during the eugenics era of the United States Supreme Court from 1905 to 1945, when the Nazis and Adolf Hitler were looking for people to cite in support of their eugenics agenda in Germany. They cited the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And we have still not fully apologized or properly sought a pardon for the actions that we took between 1905 and 1945, with the most morally offensive and horrendous decision during that time period being the eight to one United States Supreme Court decision that authorized forced sterilizations of women in this country, disproportionately poor women. And you're right about the segregation. Not only is it an analogous comparison, 
It's literally happening again because overwhelmingly the people that are skeptical of this vaccine are African-Americans, particularly in New York City. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might as well just put up there. No black people allowed in the, less than 30 percent. It's like less than 30 percent in New York City uh, of black folks have been vac fully vaccinated. So that's it's exactly. more than I thought. And you go Upper West Side, it's, I'm sure it's over 70, 75%. So I mean, what this really is, is no dissidents, no outsiders. Uh, the same people the Nazis targeted. I mean, different dissident outsider groups. They didn't just target people that were Jewish. They also targeted gypsies. They also targeted the handicapped. They also targeted anyone that didn't fit their eugenics list. They targeted gays. I mean, they, all of it. And so the the given the sort of full, I mean, that's what the play and the musical Chicago, not Chicago, but the other one that I'm blanking on, I saw at the Chicago Cats. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That, that's what you know, the whole background of. So I, I saw Terry Hatcher in it, which was actually really good at, at the Chicago. It was perfect place to see that 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 show. But they forget, you know, the broader context. We're, we're just trying to re the elites, uh, the Bill Gateses of the world, believe they have a better understanding of what's good for you including maybe your death or at least your non-existence in the future. I mean, that's his favorite thing to say is vaccines will reduce population. So it's a very interesting view to have. If Yet you're if you repeat the words he himself has said, you're in, you're an insane person. No doubt. I mean, you, you should never let a nerd like, uh, like Gates, a sociopathic nerd like him, have any control over anything like public health. Um, I mean, it shows how scary and frightening it is. But all the things that they said just a year ago were conspiracy theories are coming true right in front of us. And so I think there's a uh, people can go back and watch a debate I had with Alan Dershowitz on this as to what is the constitutional standard that should uh, before they can force a vaccine as to the city of New York, city of L.A., other places that are either contemplating it or doing it. And he agreed there needed to be clear and convincing evidence of a substantial risk of severe harm that can only be addressed or mitigated by the vaccine. The reality is, is yeah. yeah, that that standard is nowhere near met with these mandates that they're doing. In fact, so far, every single public health intervention that has been judicially tested by an actual trial on the evidence, which has mostly been denied, that the, the few that have got to a trial on the evidence every single time the government has completely failed to meet any anywhere close to that standard of, of clear and convincing evidence of a substantial risk of severe harm. Now, my view also is that from and so that would apply to the federal government and the soldiers and the military. The only successful case in this context, but one of the few cases where it's ever arisen in this context was Doe v. Rumsfeld about the anthrax vaccine that they try to rush through and force on soldiers in the early 2000s. And the federal court said, no, you can't do that. This is an emergency use authorized vaccine, has to meet the requirements of informed consent that derive from the Nuremberg Code of 1947. That is an internationally recognized and American judicially recognized legal standard governing the issue of experimental medications, which is what this is at this stage and continues to be. And so I think that there's federal statutory grounds and constitutional grounds to push back against any state or federal government action. The other thing is, I believe the Americans with Disabilities Act is a limitation on these vaccine passports and vaccine mandates, uh, because why is why are people doing it? They're doing it because the employer or the local government and the ADA covers everybody except the federal government for the most part. It covers restaurants. It covers bars. It covers you name it. There's only a few people that are outside of its reach. Uh, there's a there's an analogous version that covers schools uh, outside of just some some limited religious schools that are exempt. And what it says is you can't discriminate against someone if the you th you think they have a physical limitation. It doesn't matter if they actually have a physical limitation, just that you think they have a physical limitation. Well, what's the excuse for all these people putting in the mandate? They think being unvaccinated makes you susceptible to a dangerous disease. So they think you have a physical limitation. Mm. That's their excuse. And, and, and under that standard, once that's the case, that triggers ADA protection that says, well, you can't discriminate against that person unless you can show objective evidence of a substantial risk of severe harm that can only be accommodated for by the vaccine. With the CDC director yesterday on CNN telling people that the vaccine effectively doesn't even prevent transmission in the first place. It might prevent severity. But you've always had a right to refuse medical treatment in this country under the tort of battery and the common constitutional 
uh, liberties all the way back to the 1850s. That's been recognized. So you can't force someone to take a vaccine for their own sake. You can only do so to say, well, this will reduce transmission. And without the vaccine, there's no other way to stop the transmission causing severe harm, substantial risk, severe harm. Well, but now she's saying that actually, you know what, the vaccine doesn't appear to really reduce transmission. It might have other benefits, but it doesn't reduce transmission. That's the pretext for travel bans and mask mandates. Well, if that's the case, then there's no legal grounds under the ADA or constitutionally to compel or mandate this vaccine on anybody, in my view. But the, the hurdle is going to be the judges who have a long history. It came from the judges, our eugenics era where they said you could do forced vaccinations on penalty of fine and the Jacobson decision, then forced sterilizations against your will. And people should go back and read Buck v. v. Bell. It's a morally horrendous decision. Listen to the condescending arrogance of those Nazi wannabes who call themselves United States Supreme Court justices. Uh, and then third Korematsu, which said we could do forced detention camps based on you know fear that, of your ancestry. That's what they want to return to. Governments want that power. Big tech, want, uh, big tech wants all the money that's coming along with this. Big pharma wants all the money that's coming along with this. So you have collusion between big tech, big pharma, big media, big government to steal everybody's liberty because the only skin in the game is making them money. They are all immune. If they, if it turns out this is complete crap, you can't sue them. Not only that, I'm hearing reports that insurance companies aren't reimbursing people for vaccine-related injuries. Uh, the states are saying they're not going to give people unemployment compensation if they lay them off because of not doing the vaccine. So, I mean, I mean, the whole system's only skin in the game is screwing over the ordinary person for their self-enrichment uh, and self-empowerment. And that's why people have to fight back. And some of us, uh, Bobby Kennedy, myself and others, are definitely going to do so. Wow. Yeah, because I know that there is a protest Monday in the city. Um, I know I'll be there. Some of my uh, other friends will be there too. Yeah, it just seems like most most people don't know. We're, we're not lawyers. We don't know what our rights are. It seems like we forget or it's hard to look them up. And then it's like, but what's right in our face is all this bullying and the, and the media and social media, like kind of, you know, censoring any voice of dissent. And uh, I know I know that that's the plan is to bully people and just con constant repetition. And, and now we have our neighbors like, you know, being told, like, if you out your friend as being uh, unvaccinated, you might get a free donut or something. Uh, so it's yeah. it's a scary time. And it seems hard to, like, I think people think, oh, they, they can't stand up for themselves or they're not allowed to or what's the point, you know? Exactly. That's always the pitch. The great I always say the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people he did not exist. And the greatest trick the system ever pulled was convincing people that they cannot resist. And that's always the, I, I describe it the same as my, sort of my political experience. You're caught between two worlds. Objective evidence tells you you're not going to win, that you can't successfully resist. You look at who has power, like in this context, all the stakeholders are aligned on the side of forcing people to take this experimental drug. Uh, the, I mean, it doesn't matter who they are, whether it's big pharma, big tech, big media, big government, you name it, they're all in bed on the same side. They only have risk if you don't take it. They don't have any risk if you suffer injury from it. Um, but the, and, and, and all ordinary people that are on the opposite side, but you have to counterbalance that with, you can know objectively, it's going to be a real uphill battle, but also know that the key for them winning is that nobody fights back. And so you have to believe almost the irrational things you might look at objectively and say, man, you know, one in 10, one in 20, one in five, whatever. Uh, but you have to believe in it. And the fascinating, it was like Trump, right? To sit there in 2016, you know, he's talking to his wife, 2015, you know, and say, eh, you know, I think I can be president. I mean, you're a reality TV guy. Nobody in American history had ever been elected to the presidency without hiring, pr having prior governmental office. Nobody. It's the most powerful position in the world. And you, a reality TV guy, real estate guy, used to have a you know yachts and boats and planes and you know board games named after you. You're just gonna say, "Ah, eh, heck, screw it, I'm gonna go ahead and run," the, and I, and I'm probably gonna win. There, there was there was no logic to that from an objective empirical standard, just self belief. But the mere act of belief changed the odds, uh, and that's why I always tell people that you have to mm. believe in the impossible for the impossible to ever happen. That's inspiring. Wow. What a, 
That's great. I feel like we've been uh, lacking inspiration for sure. And it's easy to feel hopeless and, uh, and believe and people do forget like how powerful belief really is and just joining up together. Uh, I'm going to go to a couple of super chat of the super chat questions here uh, from Matthew Hammond. Has Robert considered working with other legal scholars to create a populist legal residency to create right wing lawyers that are good with constitutional issues and avoid issues like the last election? Yeah, I mean, there's several different efforts kind of partially afoot in that respect. Uh, Stephen Miller's America First Legal Group is trying to do aspects of that. The uh, Informed Consent Action Network and Robert F. Kennedy's uh, Children's Health Defense and other spaces is trying to do things like that. Uh, Hillsdale University is trying to do a lot of aspects of that. So there's little components of it. Um, the hard part is institutionalizing that kind of support architecture. And so people like myself have sort of watched and waited to see what other where the gaps would be filled in and where the gaps still exist. And most likely, you know, sometime over the next couple of years, the goal is to help create that where the gaps still exist and to fill it in. Okay, Doug. From Russell Hall, what about a religious objection to the vaccine, Mark of the Beast, and all that? The most popular religious exep exemption is, uh, and people should look at their individual state. So a lot of states have, uh, almost every state, except I think California, New York, maybe one or two others, has you have a right to a religious exemption to any vaccine mandate. They are discouraged under federal law and federal constitutional law as well from inquiring too deeply on what that religious exemption is. They can't require a religious official sign off, none of that nonsense. Um, it, at some point, it becomes religious discrimination. But the one I've I've seen most often, and it's hard for them to push back against at all, is, in fact, I even put it up at the board at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. It's at the top. What a lot of people are using that I think is uh, relevant uh, is that they used aborted, uh, you know, particularly in the University of Pittsburgh information that came out this week, they used aborted fetuses and cells from aborted fetuses to develop every single U.S. approved vaccine. And a lot of people find that morally horrifying, even if they don't necessarily aren't full scale pro-life. They're like, I don't like that. I don't like. And then they, then they see that Alex Jones was right again. And that, yes, indeed, they had been selling, you know, uh, baby organs uh, for development purposes, for medical experimentation purposes. And that's one of those things where 90 percent of the country doesn't like it. You can be pro-choice and not be for that. Um and I think that's where a lot of people would have a legitimate religious exemption. They should also look at their individual state. A lot of states have a broad, what's called a philosophical exemption. So the, you can say, look, I'm just opposed to mandated vaccines. I'm just opposed to rushed vaccines. Hmm. Um, you know, the, I'm opposed to experimental vaccines. A lot of people have religious objections to any kind of medical experimentation, uh, which is what this is when it doesn't yet have full FDA authorization or approval. So what the, you know, Nuremberg was all about never again. And yet here we're right back with people trying to do it again. And it was no more medical experimentation without informed consent, both parts, meaningful consent, no coercion, nothing else. And that it's fully informed. Neither is happening right now with these mandates. Yeah, you can see why uh, there's such the push to uh, rewrite and write over history. Um from Ghost Crusaders. Barnes looking sharp as usual, but where is the cigar? <laughs> uh, in the other room. That's where the cigar is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's not smoking on the show. I guess that's nice. Let's see. Do, do, do. From M. Tax Shark. Great discussion. Thank you both. Never thought I'd be discussing what we are today in the USA. Yeah, it's wild. No doubt. We're right back to 1925 from a legal perspective. I mean, the assumptions uh, that the that you know there's nothing worse than the when the black uh, robes get together with the white lab coats, and they've been putting us in a real life Milgram experiment for the last year, uh, seeing what they can get away with, seeing how much they can, how much we'll tolerate, how much we'll put up with, how much we'll accept before we push back and resist. Uh, and it's only public resistance in the courts of public opinion and the courts of law that give us any chance. And the odds may be stacked against us, but that's no reason not to try. You can't win if you don't try. Yeah. So really like resisting is kind of like our only option or it's Absolutely. it's enough to make an impact. Um, and from... the, it's the fifth pillar of power. The fifth pillar of power is the perception amongst the public of the other four pillars of power legitimacy. You remove that fifth pillar of power, the system collapses overnight. 
And you don't need a majority to get there. That's where Michael Malice understands that. And that's why he's in a very white pill mood these days. Uh, he he sees this, you know, he sees people awake to things they haven't been awake to in quite a while. And I don't share all of Mike's uh, views, but uh, he has some deeply, deeply good insights in that respect. I appreciate Malice, too, for exactly that, the sort of like his white pill mentality, like you have to have hope. And I always try to like impart that, you know, with comedy or just with my interviews, you know, you have to keep hope alive. And I did have another question about that. So you you have been sort of um, studying Michael Malice a bit recently um, and the American history of anarchism. Why do you think John Wilkes Booth? This was a question from a fan. Why do you think John Wilkes Booth? yelled uh sick semper tyrannis well that's an interesting question about what exactly booth's role was what what that was all about who else may have been implicated how much he was playing a role versus performed a role so the uh i i do a little hush hush series at viva barnes law dot locals dot com where we basically uh, go through alternative narratives. And there's a lot of interesting things about what happened that people forget. They didn't just try to kill Lincoln that day. They tried to kill the vice president, the secretary of state, and the general uh, uh, in charge, General Grant. Uh, and people might want to look into who might have profited from that politically, uh, who was perceived as the next in line politically, not necessarily within the power structure, but politically likely to win uh, the next election or be appointed by the Senate. So the... Uh, uh, so I think there's a lot of alternative explanations. But I think, you know, the Malice is probably the most articulate, popular advocate of anarchy since Lysander Spooner at the end of the 19th century. And that's, you know, that that's credit to him. He's very good at understanding it, very good at explicating it in accessible ways. I was always interested in Lysander Spooner because of his 1840 co-authored with Frederick Douglass argument about slavery being unconstitutional. And in fact, I agree with their theory, by the way, but the that it was never legal, really. But the system tricked people and found loopholes into not being able to make that legal challenge. So you won't find a single case that talks about whether slavery is constitutional because the courts devised all these games to keep people out and to convince people that they couldn't challenge that very assumption. But a lot of his his belief in anarchy reflected his disbelief in our legal institutions failing for 40 years. So the uh, Spooner didn't start out as an anarchist. He became one from watching the objective reality of our failed system, particularly in the post-Civil War era. Uh, and has a lot of brilliant insights along the way. And ultimately, I'm not all the way there, more of a constitutional populist. With, but uh, I, the way I describe myself is a constitutional pa populist with anarchistic tendencies, uh, just because I distrust the state. Uh, you know, the, the, those, that's where Jones and I have a shared core assumption. The people who seek power, and especially the people who get it, are exactly the people who should never have it. Um, and that's where I share some of Mike's uh, Malice's assumptions as well. And plus, Michael Malice is hilarious. And yeah, oh yeah, he's a funny little rusk. <laughs> he does a great job of yeah making a lot of his information really accessible. Like I, I just I did buy his book on anarchy, and like some of a lot of the essays are so dense to get through. And I'm just like, okay, yes. I want to I want to make it through to like his. I feel like I'm just supporting a friend. Like you wrote a book. I'm like I don't well, understand he, a lot of it. But <laughs> yeah, some of it is complex. Some mm -hmm. of it is uh, is more uh, accessible than other parts. But I also write the people can get the audio version. Uh, so the uh, I think it's out or it's close to out where, you know, he uh, he has other people narrating it and, and him narrating it. And that can be an accessible way. And it's an introduction to the ideas in certain ways. I mean, anarchism can be like communism in that, it you know, the Trotsky, I take the other this group. And you're like, what in the world is all this? I mean, you're already kind of in a political Ecle uh, eclectic area why do you get into these massive fights between each other and like some of that exists in libertarianism and, and parts of it and it's like why would anybody be interested in that but the uh uh but malice has done better than anybody at trying to aggregate that and consolidate it and make it accessible uh in ways that can be politically more popular i mean what hurt anarchism in the united states was the association of anarchy with violence between the 1880s and 1920s. Now, whether a lot of that was actually attributable to anarchists, I think is actually an open question. Uh, I think, you know, the J. Edgar Hoover established the FBI on the pretext that he was going to be the one to crack down on uh, anarchy. And you can always question anything that Hoover comes up with. <laughs> great, great. And another question here from Tom... Villers, Chrissy, please make sure Barnes doesn't start drinking as he still has to do a bourbon with Barnes tonight. <laughs> Is that your I do a now? live stream 
uh, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern time at vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Uh, that, uh, you know, we usually go for about 90 minutes, just answer a lot of questions, especially when I'm not in trial, which will be the next couple of weeks when I'm in trial, then I'm unavailable for a while. But the, uh, so yeah, that, those are fun, fun shows, fascinating sort of interaction with the audience, the whole, well, the other thing that they don't understand about Alex Jones as an example, Alex Jones is a creation of the institutional media lying so frequently to people and trying to deplatform people. Just like that, Trump it, is a creation in a kind of in a sense as well completely completely mm -hmm. they are the ones if they would quit lying and be honest and have transparency and dialogue and debate and and multi voices heard then that would shrink the audience for a trump or an alex jones the they are the ones growing the audience because of their defaming people who disagree they're deplatforming of people who disagree they're when you're scared of brett weinstein when you're scared of bobby kennedy maybe you've gone too far but the system still doesn't even recognize that when their own ideological allies, they are trying to completely destroy. I mean, like in the context of the vaccine debate, there's prominent, very pro-vaccine doctors who, who just don't agree with this vaccine in this pandemic. And yet they're being deplatformed. The guy that helped come up with the mRNA vaccine, massive defamation campaign against him just because he pointed out, hey, there's some problems here. So the uh, and I get the message they want to send. They want to tell every doctor, every scientist, you better keep your mouth shut or we'll ruin your career. Because look what we did to these people. If we can do it to Bobby Kennedy. The, the most uh, comes from the, the scion, the most famous son of the most famous political family in the history of the Democratic Party of the United States is now being targeted as the I think now the number one source of disinformation for simply pointing out to government studies and government reports and government data that raises issues. It tells you how nuts they've gone and they just don't realize how nuts they've gone. Did Bobby Kelly, did he co-wrote that book, co-write that book with um, Dr. Mercola? I'm not, I know he has a new one coming out. I think so, I, I mean, the interesting just thing is, ordered it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, but basically all Bobby Kennedy did was extend his career with, in environmental science and dealing with other areas with big pharma to the question of vaccines. He didn't say, okay, you stick a label on it, you call it a vaccine. Magically, now it's perfect. No problems whatsoever. No risks whatsoever. No, he's like, it's still big pharma making it. And now they get to mandate it, guaranteeing their profits, and they have none of the liability exposure. That's where we should really pay attention to what they're doing, particularly when they target most frequently children. Mm -hmm. And 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 but because of the you know the the religious cult like aspects of the professional class neoliberal left, where you can't question anything without being a blasphemous heretic who must be burned at the stake, uh, the institutional media and others uh, have tried to defame and and destroy him uh, for just pointing out basic facts about basic legal principles. And um, so yeah, but he continues. I'm going to be working with him on some cases challenging the FDA. Uh, challenging these vaccine mandates and just the sheer bullying they're like oh we need to listen to people who are smarter than us uh, they're saying that anything can be the science okay like if you have enough oh, dough. And these people are not if they were right they wouldn't be so scared of trials they if they real evidentiary trials they were re if they were right they wouldn't be scared of real public debates if mm. they were right they would not be deplatforming and defaming their opponents Ken, are they avoiding like a HIPAA loophole, like especially with this uh, key to New York City um, app or whatever they're going to do or the um, Excelsior pass? Like, do they avoid the, the loophole of HIPAA because you are volunteering your own medical information? It depends. Basically, they're trying to get outside of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, because that's what governs their ability to ask for your medical information in the first place, to do a medical examination. In my view, asking about your vaccination status is at, is doing a medical exam within the meaning of the ADA. The J Justice Department has come along and the EEOC under Biden has come along and said, nah, the, the asking about vaccination doesn't have any medical impact whatsoever, which makes zero sense. But so that's part one of their fantasy about medical information. And part two is uh, under HIPAA is pretending again it's not medical information. And then that's really what that's the, that's the trick to all of this. They're trying to say vaccination status somehow isn't medical information governed under either the ADA or HIPAA. And it's like, it's like, how is that? 
And so they pretend a vaccination isn't a disability, even though everybody interprets it as if, if you're unvaccinated, that you're physically or mentally limited in a substantial way. And they, they pretend it's not medical information for HIPAA purposes, at least in some context. For the most part, you have to dig into these things because like the Justice Department put in a footnote when it said maybe the federal government could mandate the vaccine even during its emergency use stage. They said, by the way, we're not opining about how HIPAA or the ADA may limit a vaccine mandate. So that was a recognition that they knew there was a problem. They're just trying to pretend it. Hope nobody reads the footnotes. Mm. Um, and, and that's and mostly what they're banking on is politicians and in power, whether they're lawyers, judges, governors, mayors, whatever, will uh, not stand up for people's rights and will fold to the to the combination of big pharma, big media and the big government, because historically they have. And so the question is whether our courts will stand up and do what they're supposed to do or will once again fail the American public in the way they did back at the turn of the last century. And the only way to find that out is to fight it out. So do you think that is a bigger threat rather than it being approved for FDA use or? Uh... It, I, I would say the mandate is the biggest threat because the now the FDA approval will increase the risk of mandates. But right now, I mean, you know, Walmart's talking about mandating it. Mary Kay's talking about mandating it. Major governments are talking about mandating it. Military's talking about mandating it. So it's spreading everywhere. I mean, Costco, I mean, you know, just huge companies are talking about mandating it and mandating it on a ridiculous time scale. Like next week, you better be vaccinated or you're fired. Don't care if you've been employed for 30 years. Don't care if you have a medical exemption. Don't care if it will actually, uh, you've already had COVID. So in fact, it could provide no benefit for you, period. Uh, can only provide risk. Doesn't, uh, doesn't matter if you have a religious exemption. Doesn't matter if you have a philosophical exemption. All of it. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. We have never done this in our history. Just like we have never done mass house arrests in response to a pandemic like we did last year. We've never said you can't op op open up your own business in the name of a pandemic. You can't send your kid to school for a whole year in the name of a pandemic that doesn't even impact children uh, to any great degree at all. Uh, we've never done any of these things. So that's why I say it's a real live Milgram experiment for governments to figure out how much can we turn our citizens into slaves. And so far, they've had more shocking success than they should. And the only way to fight back is, you know, old school uh re rebellions like uh, nat turner style absolutely uh from technical chat regarding mask mandates when i hear it's the law it was once the law that not everyone could drink from the same water fountain unfair comparison it, it is a fair because when people say jacobson i mean i see all these liberals citing this old 1905 case that by the way was much more limited all it said back then was that you could issue a very small fine if you stayed unvaccinated during a smallpox epidemic when the smallpox vaccine had been established as safe and effective for a century. So that's very different than what's happening here. That's part one. Part two is that decision. When I see these lefties citing it, like that was the only basis for forced sterilizations of approval in, 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 uh, in the Buck v. Bell case. The only case they could cite was Jacobson. It's like, do you realize you're, you're saying, woo, we can get eugenics back in America? Because that's what they're doing. They're establishing the legal predicate for eugenics to return to America. And if they don't want that to happen, they have to remove the, the legal predicate for it. And so I, I think the fact that they say, and, that, and that's not the law. That's what a bunch of judges said. We live Now, that's the reality of how the law has always been. That's part of Michael Malice's argument about we've never been governed by the rule of law. It's always been the rule of men. That's true. But we believe in the principle of the rule of law. But when somebody says the law says something, well, really what they're often saying is judges said something. And judges have been wrong more often than they've been right in this precise context over American history. So the fact they screwed up in the past has no reason to screw up again. And that's uh, so those analogous arguments are very analogous. Interesting. OK, from Matthew Hammond, do Second Amendment sanctuary counties have a chance of success? Could they arrest state police and are feds trying to enforce on unconstitutional laws? Well, Bloomberg just tried to uh, be in the biggest gun control advocate in the in the world, money wise, uh, just try to get a uh, Oregon County's sanctuary status removed. And the court said he didn't have authority to sue. So they won that first big challenge, which was very important and critical. So we'll see. Uh, and there, you know, the left established a lot of sanctuary precedents in their favor for sanctuary status in the immigration context during the Trump era. So they maybe start to regret the very cases that they helped establish the legal basis for. So we'll see how it all unfurls and unfolds. But I think for the most part, their sanctuary status will be preserved. 
how far they can take it will be a different matter. They probably won't be able to interfere with federal duties. We're seeing that issue in the Texas lawsuits with uh, between the governor and the Biden administration about releasing COVID infected illegal immigrants into the local region. And so we'll see how all of that translates. But that that part of it, they can go to a certain point. I think they'll be protected, but they can't go as far as uh, interfering with federal law enforcement. That leads us perfectly to this next question. Can border states enforce immigration law? Not according to the courts. I think they should be able to. But the courts have said during the Obama era that that information is uh, that that is preempted by federal law so that you could even pass a local law to enforce basic things within your own state if it Im interfered with federal immigration priorities. Now, they started to undermine those principles when they attacked Trump related to the Muslim ban or what they called the Muslim mm -hmm. ban. Um, so again, they may have, the left may have undermined their own position about this ability, but my guess is what we saw from the federal court in Texas is likely what most courts are going to do, which is to say that the uh, border states cannot directly enforce immigration law without the consent of the feds. And is there an argument there? Like all these, uh, illegal immigrants are coming through. No one's testing them for COVID. You know, you, we hear DeSantis speak a lot about this like well, how are we gonna man how are we gonna mandate our own citizens when we're not at all checking all these uh you know immigrants coming through well yeah no doubt in fact he apparently knew that he was uh releasing covid infected illegal immigrants throughout the country because he had the military secretly bringing people in and releasing them into various parts of the whole nation and yet he says he's so deeply concerned about covid that he's got to start mandating it on our own soldiers I mean, that clear contradiction it tells you what the real objective is that maybe it doesn't have a lot to do with COVID uh, has a lot to do with governmental power and so you know COVID is mutating into governmental power disease but the uh, uh we'll see but basically that well the, the Texas sheriffs have brought a suit against the Biden administration there have been prior suits against the Biden administration for non-enforcement of immigration laws and so why the feds can preempt the state from enforcing immigration laws so far courts have also said the feds cannot abandon enforcement of immigration law to the detriment of the local community so that the local county or uh, city can sue the state to force them to enforce it. So we'll see. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of this, uh, how this shakes out. The brilliance of the COVID infection cases is it highlights cognitive dissonance by the Biden administration. And that's embarrassing to the judiciary that might want to protect them. How do they say on the one hand, hey, this is such a scary virus, you can go do things you've never been allowed to do in the history of our government and say it's not such a scary virus that the local government could even enforce its own local laws to protect its own citizenry. It'll be interesting watching them try to walk that tightrope. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK, from Chicago Box, I don't think it's possible for us to avoid conflict anymore due to half the population views and beliefs being completely antithetical to the other. Yeah, I agree. I feel like there's two separate realities right now. Yeah, and I think that will continue to be the case, but it's where the, there can be populist breakthrough against the establishment, and we're starting to see that in the vaccine passport, vaccine mandate context. It's working class Latinos, working class African Americans who agree with working class people of all ethnic uh, ancestries who have doubts and skepticism about the government's power grab in this context. It's why Newsom faces a real risk of recall in a state that's a plus 30 Democratic state. Um, so it, it slowly, it, if there's more where you can get cross infection across cross party, cross political, cross ideological, shared beliefs challenging the system on these core issues, I think is where you may see real change occur. I've been thinking a lot about like the the vaccine mandate for the military, and I'm just like, wow, you look at the the marketing that's been coming out, like the pro LGBT, pro trans, whatever. The the uh, the marketing is clearly showing like inclusion rather than like strength, which we've historically seen for like classic military marketing, right? So we have that and now we have these, you know, supposed vaccine mandates. It almost to me seems like they're trying to filter or push out anybody in the military who might be more on the conservative side, many anyone who's more liberty minded, uh, you know, maybe who someone who's more likely to stand up for themselves. If they can either force these individuals into submission or push them out of the military, to me that seems like they're trying to get the military to a place where it's weakened uh, and they're more likely to obey. I mean, I'm trying not to say the word pu like pussified, but there's it's hard to <laughs> describe it otherwise. Well, it's political purge. It's a political purge. And it's where where malice has a point is that when the sergeants and the soldiers and the police force and the military refuse to enforce the state's will and dictates is when the state collapses. 
that I mean, now he he has much more animus towards them than I do. Um, but he has a core uh, statement that's right there, core premise that's right there. And so I think they're paranoid of that. And that's why they were trying to use January 6th and now other events to purge the military of anybody who would be willing to push back or say no. Uh, the same of police. They want to purge the police. I mean, really what they didn't want to do was defund the police as much as defund the police they don't like. In other words, they want pol the police aligned with them that will do whatever they tell them to do. If it means arrest grandma or grandpa like they did in Australia, I think it was, where just for not wearing a mask, it turned out he had a right not to wear a mask because of his health problem, has a heart attack, may now be dead, may, may die uh, because the cops, you know, just reflexively, reactively uh, were very physical in arresting him for actually being, and they were completely wrong, even assuming such nonsense was a good law in the first place. They want people who will not question authority. And so that's their real purge, a uniting goal. And they see alignment with Trump. They see alignment with conservative causes. They see alignment with any sense of tradition. They say any alignment with any sense of independence. They know that somebody who gets all excited uh, about, you know, the critical race theory and is all in favor of whatever the latest woke revelation is and uh, does, you know, sees, you know, men are women and women are men and whatever you feel like today. Uh, they know that's the kind of person that will say and do whatever the government wants them to do. Uh, and that's what they're trying to do is to make sure there's no dissident sergeants, no dissident uh, soldiers who could push back against their attempts to completely control the domestic population. It sounds almost like they're a little scared, you know, like. Oh, they... yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and they have been surprised at the level of resistance. I mean, someone like Alex Jones is supposed to be DOA by now. I mean, he was, I mean, they deplatformed him by every possible means. You know, people couldn't use PayPal to even fund their, pro, you know, the products he sells. I mean, they, they did everything. They went after his banks. They went after everything. Uh, went after his email. MailChimp automatically suspended everybody who was on his email list. Uh, I mean, they did everything possible to destroy the guy in, in short order. And instead, he's more popular than ever. And so the when they see things like that, it terrifies them. Trump was supposed to be DOA 100 different times. And instead, he almost won the election. Uh, and depending on what you think, you know, the there's people who doubt some ways in which the election was conducted as to the outcome of the winners. So the uh, so, you know, those kind of things really terrify them. And the and the fact that Newsom is now in trouble in California, not not good for them. This is a place that shouldn't be at risk. Uh, so when you when you aggregate those things, uh, they are terrified of their own populace. And this is always true. It, it the way I describe it is think of the government today as uh, slave masters and plantation owners in the 1850s. They're always terrified of their own slaves. They always were wondering, when are they going to come in and slit my throat in the middle of the night? Uh, when are they going to come in and overthrow the whole system? And so there, there are the, the system needs popular assent. Uh, and when, and they, when they see big signs, they don't have it in key places of power. They're going to be terrified. And unfortunately, sometimes they'll react with more repression rather than more democracy. I think that's good for we the people to remember that we do still have that power, especially when it feels, you know, pretty hopeless overall. No doubt. Uh, from Caper 2X, have Biden's actions so far provided with good grounds for impeachment if GOP takes Congress back, or do we have to wait until he qualifies for the 25th? My own, I'm opposed to both of them uh, because I, I want democratic control of presidential elections. I think impeachment should be limited to serious crimes. I don't like the wide politicization of impeachment. I didn't like it in the case of Bill Clinton. I didn't like it in the case of Donald Trump. Uh, and I don't like the 25th Amendment being used for anything except the guy who's on the death his deathbed. Uh, because otherwise, as we saw with Trump, they'll try to misuse and abuse it to seize power in an undemocratic way. So I want fewer loopholes in our system that remove power from the people and put it in the hands of politicians. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, I don't see any grounds for either impeachment or 25th Amendment that I support as it relates to Biden or anyone else. Interesting. Interesting. And I had another fan question. They wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, the lawsuit you're filing this month against the Federal Reserve. Could you talk a little bit more about why that's happening? Sure. So what we're doing is we're filing a FOIA request as the first part of the legal process. So the request under the Freedom of Information Act for a wide range of information. We're requesting it from a wide range of Federal Reserve banks and the federal board itself. Uh, including a, a wide range of internal memorandums and documents and emails and communications and conversations they've kept hidden for quite some time about what they understand their own uh, limits of their own legal authority to be. 
And so I started that with George Gammon, and that will be an ongoing process throughout the summer and fall. Uh, my anticipation is we'll probably reach the court stage sometime, uh, probably uh, you know November or December of next year, the uh, because they have some you know they have some leeway in how they respond before we can go right into the federal court itself. But I presume we'll likely have to get to the federal court itself because I presume they'll try to hide a lot of information that we're requesting. But it's a it's to force the best way to audit the Fed is to FOIA the Fed, and the best way to end the Fed is to first audit the Fed. And so the goal is to really remind people what who this organization is, that this is, you know, the Federal Reserve is basically the private bankers of the world getting to control our monetary and economic policy. And do we really want that to be the case or should we return power to the people? And part of the best way to expose that is the fact they have double sets of books, the fact that they hide a lot of information in those books, the, they hide a lot of information of conflicts of interest. Uh, and they hide in information about knowing their own limits of legal authority that they've constantly breached over the last century. So we're going to continue. So the goal is to keep marching away and to have public exposure and use it as sort of a way to open the door to a broader conversation where people might not you know, get into the, de the nitty gritty of monetary policy, but understand there's a big problem with big banksters running our government's financial policy and getting to hide information about what they're up to. Yeah. You're giving me so much hope, Robert. You're such a boss. Um, <laughs> other than what you mentioned uh, that folks can do, whether citing like philosophical, right, or religious exemption for the jab, like what are things the everyday person can do if they're feeling hopeless? Yeah. I mean, the other thing, people should find out whether they have the antibody. A lot of people don't know that they already got COVID, don't know they already have an antibody for COVID. That's a pretty strong argument for your employer not requiring you to have a vaccine. And if they're so unreasonable, they're not willing to consider that, then, you know, it's, it's in my view, grounds for suit. So it's first of all, like if, if you hear about a mandate, don't assume whatever language they put in an email is honest. Ask for the actual policy because the policy will often have loopholes in it. Look up your local state's laws. Uh, there's a uh, find out, what, do I have a religious exemption under my state? Do I have a philosophical exemption under my state? Do I have a medical exemption? Consider why it is you don't want the vaccine. Do you not want the vaccine for moral reasons, religious reasons, or medical reasons? Uh, consider, like, for many people, it, it triggers their anxiety. For other people, they have underlying conditions that they have, are concerned it will get worse. For other people, they fit within a demographic group that puts it more, that makes right now the vaccine, experimental vaccine, more risky than COVID presents as a risk to them. So figure out what your basis is, find out what the rules are, uh, and then figure out how you can meet those rules. And often religious exemptions are met, like the University of Indiana case, the media covered a lot. Oh, look, the Seventh Circuit said it's just fine. What, no, what they didn't cover in great detail is the fact the reason why the suit sort of lost its legs is because the University of Indiana agreed to dramatically expand its religious exemption so that almost every plaintiff in the case was out of the case because they were granted a religious exemption. So the religious exemption is very powerful. People underrate it and understate it. People don't understand the medical exemption can be beyond just a doctor's permission slip in certain instances. Don't realize they have a philosophical exemption for them. Don't realize that the policy has 100 loopholes in it. The other thing is you can always ask for reasonable accommodation. Could you do your work for remotely? For example, could either COVID, and I know people don't like COVID testing or masks, but they may prefer COVID testing and masks to a vaccine if they don't have an otherwise exemption. See if your local employer is requiring that, given companies like Pfizer making the vaccine, they're authorizing that exemption. Like the federal government made a big deal about how this is going to be a mandate, but so far you dig into the details, there are a whole bunch of exemptions available for people. If the only thing you got, and if you already have the COVID antibody, you shouldn't have to test for any of it. Um, and the, uh, because that is sufficient immunity, more immunity than what a vaccine says, uh, becoming basically familiar with what the various medical literature and science is in an accessible way probably is helpful. Self-education is self-empowerment and then continue to be involved and engaged in a public discussion, public debate, public dialogue with your friends, family, and others. If this issue really matters to you so that you remind people, this is about choice. This is about informed consent. This is about the person having autonomy over their own medical decisions in their own body because you don't have a democracy if you can't control your own body. Absolutely. And it's good to remember that, especially when maybe your boss is trying to bully you into this or colleagues, coworkers. I know a lot of us have had even close family members trying to bully us into this. And I think um, the drummer for the offspring, P. Parada, is a good example of somebody who laid out like, look, I talked with my doctor. I have I don't know if he had like 
something that was a result of many other vaccines in the past. And he was like, look, like I'm going to have really adverse effects if I keep, you know, getting more vaccines and, and like really went into detail about his personal medical records. Um, but I think it was a good, it was a good example of like, look, you know, you can reject this thing and not be a crazy anti-vaxxer or a crazy conspiracy theorist, which is what they love to label you as if you just ask questions about this thing. And you can find doctors that that agree that if you previously had COVID, you should not. There's a lot of pressure on the doctors currently. There's medical associations threatening to investigate them if they approve more than five people. But the there are several doctors willing to stand up to all of that. And in particular, for example, if you previously had COVID, willing to say it's too risky for you to get any vaccine when you've already had COVID, you're better protected against infection, whereas the, there's just risk, there's no reward. And in fact, there may even be risk from COVID itself due to the way the vaccine interacts with the prior infection in ways that makes a person potentially more vulnerable. So there's a lot of doctors out there willing to support that. And uh, and so there's a lot of more rights than people realize, but it relies upon them knowing that information and asserting those rights in order to protect those rights. And I assume people can go to your website, Viva Barnes Law, uh, actually, and go to your locals page as well. Yeah. Uh, that's the best place to go is the locals page mm -hmm. there. There's an aggregation of information. There's examples of letters that other employees have sent in that at least have been partially successful uh, in getting reversal or reconsideration of various of these mandatory policies. There's a lot of information shared there. There's uh, on, on, in all of my updates on all the suits that I'm bringing or anyone else has brought in the vaccine context or the elections context will exclusively be at vivabarneslaw.locals.com because YouTube doesn't like these discussions to go in too much detail. No, they do not. And um, where else can people um, follow you on social media? Are you on Twitter? Uh, that's the best place. Yeah, Keepitmartinslaw.locals.com locals. Locals because everything else is there. There's Twitter, there's whatnot, but that's the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Robert. You're giving giving us a lot of hope uh, at a time where we really need it most. So appreciate your time very much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye.